All right, first off, I am not Megan Saunders. Megan Saunders was supposed to do the presentation today. She's the executive director of the 2030 district in Stamford. Uh, she is on, she's in Chicago at the national meeting for the 2030 district. Uh, so I was asked to give this presentation, and as you can see, I'm now the second economic development director to come up here and start talking about sustainability. And what's interesting is, is I, I just came to Stanford about a year ago. Uh, I was in New York before that. Uh, I was chair of the regional sustainability uh, study for the Mid-Hudson region. And that regional sustainability study dovetailed into uh, the Mid-Hudson Regional Economic Development Council strategy. And Melissa Everett, who's sitting in the back, and I see her. Hello, Melissa. Uh, she was with us as part of that when she did her work in New York. Uh, what's interesting is that sustainability really is turning into an economic development issue, uh, especially in Stanford, and we look at a lot of the corporations that we have there. So what I want to do is just go through a little bit of what we're trying to do in, in Stanford. There we go. Uh, and talk a little bit about the 2030 district and then a little bit about what Stanford is doing itself. Um, the 2030 district started uh, is from Architecture 2030, which is a national parent organization of all the 2030 districts. It's an independent nonprofit uh, organization that was established in response to climate change in 20, uh, 2002. Uh, their mission is to rapidly transform the built environment from major contributors uh, to the central part of the solution uh, to the climate and energy crisis. According to the United States Energy Information Administration, the building sector consumes nearly half of all energy produced in the United States and produces nearly half of all CO2 emissions. When you look at Stanford alone and the amount of square footage, we have close to, uh, we have close to uh, 28 million square feet of office space within the city itself. Uh, we have some of the highest costs in terms of running these buildings. And so when we start to look at that, that's a pass through onto the per square footage for our companies and small businesses that have to pay. Uh, so we look at it that really changes to the way buildings run are uh, sort of paramount in terms of looking at being part of that solution for climate change. So the 2030 district, there is 10 established districts and seven emerging districts. Um, the 2030 districts were then, you know, created as part of this was to reduce the energy and CO2 emissions from the buildings. Uh, the 10 cities that are involved in this are San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, uh, and the seven emerging districts, uh, Portland, Maine, uh, as well as I believe New York City is now emerging and they're about to start theirs. Uh, so when you look at it and start to combine all of the different districts within uh, the United States, you're looking at about 225 million square feet of office space that's really being transformed. There are three goals for the 2030 district uh, that Architecture 2030 came up with, and the plan for all the, the 2030 districts is to keep it exactly the same. Uh, so they want to keep global temperature down and reverse climate change. So they're addressing this through building energy use, water consumption, and transportation, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And if you've ever been to Stanford and you try to go down 95, you know very much that we need to get more people off 95 uh, because of that congestion is absolutely terrible. When it takes you almost an hour to come from Bridgeport to Stanford, uh, that's an issue that really needs to be addressed. Uh, all of the cities, and like I said, we're trying to, uh, as part of the 2030, is standardizing it. So all the cities follow the same energy and water use and transportation emission reduction goals. Uh, so we started to look at the existing buildings, and so the existing buildings start off with a 10% reduction of the goals and become extremely more stringent uh, as you reach the 2030 uh, with a 50% reduction across the board. New buildings need to be designed to meet energy consumption performance standards of 70% below the national median for the building type and carbon neutral in the year 2030. Based on our current date, we have uh, actually it's 6.5 million square feet uh, that has been committed in Stanford, and 5.8 million square feet of it has been benchmarked already. Uh, there's been an 8% reduction in energy use alone just as we started to benchmark these buildings. Uh, we're still working on water and transportation bed, uh, baselines, and we should have results on that later on this year. The district itself operates as a public-private partnership of building owners, managers within the district boundary uh, who've come together with local governments, businesses, and community stakeholders who will provide services and collaboration to achieve these goals. The key part of that is bringing that collaboration together. We have an energy company with us. 
We have most of the property owners in the downtown area, as well as numerous businesses that are helping to support this. And most of all, we have the City of Stanford behind this. Uh, the City of Stanford, Mayor David Martin, is pushing this as part of our economic development strategy. We look at this as we would like to lead the Northeast in sustainability, and we are doing that right now. So as a district, we were able to level, uh, leverage financing, share resources, and best practices. Uh, the city is doing, undergoing numerous changes, and we we're able to share that through our energy conservation measures, uh, as well as confidently assess building performance relative to their peers. The nice thing with this program, though, is that all of the information, when you benchmark a building, it is kept private uh, because some of it is proprietary. You don't want to uh, be letting out some of that information. And so by running it through a third party, through the 2030 district, which is part of the Business Council of Fairfield, you're able to keep that private because if it was running through the city, it would be uh, available to FOIA. But it's kept private, and so then that way the analysis and uh, the changes can be made through the Business Council. Uh, the other thing that we're working on right now is providing training and education uh, for all of the building owners to learn about the resources and how they can meet their goals. So the question up is why Stanford? And that's a question I ask all the time. Uh, we are the sixth 2030 district that was launched officially in October 2014 uh, with a population of 128,000 people and 38 square miles. We are the fastest growing city in Connecticut. Uh, we expect to be larger than New Haven by the end of this year. Uh, we currently have six billion dollars worth of development that is happening there. That's not million, that's billion with a B. And so when we look at our new buildings coming up, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing with our buildings for the next 30 to 40 years. Stanford is also ideal uh, for this initiative because, well, it's the second largest energy market in New England, uh, the fastest growing, which is Boston. Uh, we do have some of the hen highest energy costs. The building stock is aging, and we're starting to replace some of that building stock, but also looking at uh, redoing part of that. And when you look at some of our Class A space, it really, I, I would call it Class B when you look at the New York market. Uh, so a lot of the companies now are looking to upgrade their buildings, and energy efficiency is one of the main factors that they're looking at. Uh, the city is home to Fortune 500 companies uh, with global leaders and therefore has potential to affect the culture and major national and international uh, corporations. Starwoods is probably one of our biggest supporters on this. Uh, they are a global leader on sustainability and they're active on our board. Um, we have numerous other companies as we've been reaching out to them, getting their sustainability people involved as part of this 2030 district. So again, it's not just the building owners in the city, but we're trying to get the companies involved in this to make it say, hey, you're part of the solution here. So local power systems in standard, uh, Stanford have proved unreliable during uh, increased uh, storm severity associated with climate change, and this was evident during Superstorm Sandy. Uh, all of our area around here was without power from anywhere from three days to almost just over a week to a week and a half. Um, so as part of what we're doing in the 2030 district, our goal is to really try to address our energy consumption, but also our energy production, uh, water and transportation. Uh, and this is a little bit different than some of the other 2030 districts. Um, the district recently engaged with IBM uh, to work through the UN City Disaster Resiliency Scorecard. Uh, we did a change. Oh, is it not uh, these things? The, um, we had IBM come in and do the scorecard for Stanford. And it was interesting, it was a day long exercise that looked at how well Stanford is prepared according to what the UN is looking at worldwide. In terms of Stanford, tactically, we are incredible. We have quick response, our EMS, uh, all of our emergency operation services during storms, perfect. We scored very, very high. Strategically though, and when you look at the long term, that's where we falter. And we are now taking steps to start to address that. We're starting to look at our MS4 permitting as part of the stormwater uh, to in uh, integrate that into our site design. Uh, we're looking at energy efficiency in all of our new buildings that are, as you said, as part of this district that are being constructed. Uh, we're working with Eversource to get them in on the ground floor before the designs are done uh, to get their incentives in place for these building owners. Uh, I had one building that's being built next to City Hall. Uh, it's about 200 units. 
Um, it's actually one of our smaller buildings that we're getting built. Um, and we were able to sit down with AirPortSource with them. Uh, that owner was able to receive about half a million dollars in incentives by making a few changes. Never, you never would have thought of looking at that before. And now I have a much better building that's being built next to City Hall. One of the things that we've also started in Stanford is the Energy Improvement District. This was started in 2007. Uh, this was started by our then mayor, uh, Daniel Malloy, who now governor. Uh, the intent was to provide the property owners with a chance to provide alternative energy uh, systems, including distributed energy or microgrids. Uh, as of last year, uh, I had new legislation passed by the Board of Representatives. Uh, so we've expanded beyond our first cut of the Energy Improvement District, which is just our downtown. Uh, and now we are citywide. So the ability for property owners to start their own microgrid or combined heat and power or fuel cells and to be able to distribute that across properties is now citywide. So it's not just focused on the downtown. And again, we're looking at that as part of our strategy for resiliency. Uh, with the centralization of a lot of the energy infrastructure within the Northeast, uh, we're looking at it, we need to decentralize some of that. Uh, so if we have major corporations that need to be up and operating, uh, they need a guaranteed power source. And we're looking at how do we provide that for them. One of the things that we're working on is with City Hall. Uh, we're going to put in a brand new combined heat and power unit as part of our microgrid, and I'm waiting for those applications to come up so I can apply. We are ready to go. It is designed, and we just are, we need the grant. So no, no pressure. But um, what's interesting with our combined heat and power is uh, we're going to be taking our excess power, excess heat, and moving it to Charter Oak, which is our housing authority, with our two buildings right behind it. Uh, so during both spring and fall, usually when you get the most peaks on both the load and the, the heat, uh, those are going to be transformed, uh, transmitted over to uh, the housing authority. Uh, we're hoping to be able to reduce Charter Oak's operating costs, uh, but it also helps out the city by adding another revenue stream into it. So when you look at distributed generation system, uh, most people know about this, but I would say we're looking at a payback of an investment of about three to five years on this. Uh, the nice thing is with our demand management, uh, we're looking at in terms of investing in our energy saving, uh, energy conservation saving um, measures throughout City Hall is about one to two, uh, but most of all is our demand response. And so we'll be able to tailor our energy needs within City Hall instantaneously, and that's an that's a instant payback right there. Oh, still higher? Okay, let me move this closer. All right. Um, the other thing that we have is, as part of our IBM scorecard I was alluding to, is resiliency to address the system of systems within the city. And that's what a lot of the sustainability is. You have to look at the systems of systems. It's not just that one component. And so we're looking at multiple connections throughout. So as part, again, as part of what we looked at, it's gonna take years to do this. And so we've been charting out all of our different steps that we have to look at within the city itself to make this done. One of the programs that we're trying to start to initiate, and this is gonna lead into, and you'll see where I'm going with this, is a lunchtime recycling program. And when I was in Westchester County in New York, uh, we had numerous schools that were doing this. And the reason why this is very important is because you have an educational factor that starts right in the schools. Now everybody goes, well, you know, lunch school uh, recycling program, well, really, how's that work? Well, what it does is it takes the lunch from air, at lunchtime and you start to sort it out, source separation. So you dump the milk out into a big container, uh, you put the carton into another thing, you scrape the food off and put it into an organic waste container, and then you put the regular garbage away and take anything else recycling. Um, What's really interesting with this is as you start to teach the kids this, it really starts to, you start to have a huge amount of cost savings. The city of New Rochelle, uh, when they implemented this program, was able to take their standard black bags, and typically they, they used about 17 of those big black bags every lunch hour. Uh, they were able to take that budget from approximately $80,000 down to $30,000, just by having the kids source separate their lunch, because now it's not contaminated waste. Then you had a, the Tetra packs that were all recycled. They were able to, the school was able to start selling those, and they actually started making money on that. They were able to take and reduce their overall hauling costs from the schools because now they didn't have mixed garbage, and they were able to have one 
uh, truck take the organic waste out and the other truck take that half a bag of garbage at the end into their regular system. Now, what's interesting with this is uh, I'm Canadian. Uh, in Nova Scotia, we were doing this in 1999, but we weren't doing this on a school level uh, at all. We did this citywide. In 1999, Halifax, Nova Scotia said, we are not going to allow any more organic waste to go into our garbage system and our solid waste system. So they came up with a three garbage can system. You had a green bin, the blue bin, and the black bin. The green bin is picked up every week, all the organic matter, and that is taken up and composted. The blue bin is taken off to recycling, and the black bin is picked up every two weeks. And that's your regular garbage, because most of the stuff that was being put into the garbage could either be recycled or composted. Now, as I was talking about before, the system of systems, this is what it's starting to lead into. And it's overall, it starts to affect the budgets. So the organic waste, uh, we're able to take that out. Uh, that is a huge energy source. And so when you get into anaerobic digestion, you're able to take that organic waste out, create methane gas, compress it, clean it, and now you can actually use it. To be able to use your own locally sourced methane gas, you can now start to feed into a fuel cell. Either a small fuel cell at a school, or what we're going to be looking at is potential for our WPCA. And so it's based on the, the same system that I've talked to Turning Earth with, and they're building up in Southington. It's a $20 million state-of-the-art organic recycling facility. It converts uh, 50,000 tons of uh, source-separated organics, and then another was it 20,000 tons of yard leaf waste. Uh, that is going to produce about 1.4 megawatts of power. The other important part of this is the sustainability component side. So now you've got the compost left over and the tea and everything else after you've made your me uh, methane gas, uh, they're growing about 1.4 million heads of lettuce off there, and these are specialty lettuce. So they're now taken into the greenhouses, and so now we're going full circle. So not only are we taking our organic waste, converting it into energy, but we're taking that waste and using it to help have local source food. Again, this is very simple to do, but we have to have a will to do something like this and the imagination to look at something like this to start making those connections. So again, what we're looking at for the city of Stanford is to take a system of system like this, so our energy improvement district, be able to reduce our energy costs, take all our organic waste from not only the city but all of our buildings, and start to take probably the biggest energy hog we have, which is our water pollution control center, and start to reduce those costs. That, in a turn, will start reducing the overall taxes and everything else for the city and for our residents. But it will also, again, lead Stanford as being leading the sustainability for the Northeast. So now let me get back to a little bit of the 2030 district of, of part of what we're doing. And like I said, it, it's a public-private partnership. Um, we're looking at the different dues within the uh, members alone, but we also receive outside funding. So we have the Kresge Foundation, the Tremaine Foundation, and the John Merrick uh, Fund that have been help funding the startup in this. And then we have representatives here, and I appreciate everything um, that they've done to be able to get this off the ground for us. Um, really, it was these, these foundations that really kick-started this to help us get to where we need to go. And it was really the seeds that they've planted that are going to lead us to bigger and greater things. So currently right now we have 34 members, 15 property owners and managers, 11 community partners, and 8 professional partners. Um, but this is growing uh, each month. As we're getting the word out and we're starting to show our plan and what we're trying to get done, uh, it is growing and growing. I have five minutes left, but I'm going to end a little early for everybody. So you can ask a little questions. But, um, I can't speak enough of what the Business Council is doing with this, plus all of our supporters. Uh, this is truly revolutionary in terms of what we're trying to get done in the sort of southwestern part of Connecticut. Uh, I encourage everybody, if you, got a, if, you, if you have your Twitter account out, um, please tweet Stanford 2030 for me, just so that Megan, uh, who's in Chicago, will start getting hit with all of those. Um, and just let her know that, you know, really this is something that if you'd like to emulate, please talk to her. 
Um, it's not, you don't have to be part of the district, but these are concepts and programs that we would like to be able to share throughout Connecticut. So again, tweet her, I'd really appreciate that. If you want to tweet me, I'm Stanford Economic Development. Um, you can find more information on the website, which is our 2030district.org, uh, uh, hashtag Stanford. Uh, there's our phone numbers. Again, um, we're thrilled to be able to at least show off some of the things that we're doing. Uh, we're taking a very much big picture approach in Stanford uh, on our sustainability. Um, I have to, to call out, I got Robin Stein here who's sitting in the back. Uh, Robin Stein was the former Land Bureau Chief for Stanford. Uh, he's now Special Assistant to the Mayor of Stanford. Uh, Robin was instrumental in doing a lot of the original sustainability uh, programs within Stanford in terms of our solar panels uh, as well as getting uh, a lot of the legislation passed that we ha are using currently within Stanford. So again, we've had people coming in before me uh, who are now working with me, um, but we still have a long way to go on some of this stuff. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. We have time for some questions. My question about composting is, it, it looks like you're moving towards making it um, available to residents? Correct. Is that assumption correct? Yeah. And what is your timeline for that? Uh, we're still in the investigation phase to look at the cost-benefit ratios on everything, uh, as well as we're tracking and looking at all of our recycling rates within the city itself, uh, as well as our um, looking with our private um, contractors that pick up a lot of this stuff. So the I guess key, the, the if you key can keep is, us informed on that, that would be, yeah. that would be great. <laughs> our, our first step that we look at, to be honest, is to get it into the schools. If we can get the kids source separating right off the bat in the schools, and this is what they, they did in Halifax as well, that is key because I got to say the guilt factor of your child coming home and yelling at you for not putting <laughs> the eggshells in the green bin is uh, huge. And so uh, I get that all the time, you know, like uh, my house, I, I think I'm the only one in my block in Stratford that I have three, uh, I have uh, three recycling bins. I have a big blue tote and two boxes. And I swear I put out more in recycling. Uh, and then I have my own compost pile uh, that I use compared to my regular black garbage uh, compared to everybody else on the street. Everybody else has got two or three bins. I've got such little garbage that goes out because we sort of separate everything. Um, I guess my last question is, um, and you probably haven't thought this far ahead, but what would be your strategy for um, educating the residential population and business population to compost? Well, f first step is to get the schools done. And so we'll have this program set up and moving through the schools. Uh, we want to get that in at least for a year, uh, so everybody's aware of that. Um, and then start to branch out, and we'll take pilot areas within the city itself. Um, that's always easiest. You start with pilot because that's that is uh, easier way for residents to understand what's happening because they go, oh, it's a pilot. Well, it may not last forever, and so uh, it's easier to start the pilot program. But really, what we like to do is just start small, find out where we can get the low, the, you know, as I say, the low hanging fruit, and get people involved in that. So, hey, Alyssa, Thomas. how you doing? Hey, yeah. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wonder if you could talk a little about the levels of preparation and planning for, get, for a community that may want to get involved in 2030 district to not sure. be sorry they did that. All right. Um, if you go to the 2030 site, they do have applications for this. Uh, it's really getting together a group of people, a task force, to start talking about this. And that's key right there. Uh, and then be able to apply, apply and be able to move forward. Um, they'll come interview interview you, make sure that this is something that's not going to fail. They really want to make sure you have commitment on all levels from the city government to the property owners and the business community, you know, that sort of trifecta, uh, to make sure that everything that you're going to do is going to move forward. So again, the business council took this on, mm -hmm. um, and when I came uh, to Stanford from Westchester, uh, this is one of the first things I got introduced to, and they heard what I was doing there in Westchester, and they got super excited and said, great, we, we got a champion. And so I'm really championing this through the city to make sure that this happens. So having stable, credible organizations that yeah. do their homework. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you.